30 days yeah. to get it right. Yeah, and he was cited. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody this evening to our workshop. Um, this evening, uh, we've got a lot of stuff on the agenda. The mayor will not be here in person. He'll be uh, joining us remotely. I'll be sitting in, occupying his seat for the evening. And we'll start with roll call. Um, I see Molly, Justice, Paloma, Ren, and Dan, and Chris are all here. And we have Drew Gamels as our uh, city attorney uh, attending remotely. Um, so the first item on the agenda this evening uh, is the Beacon High School students participatory budgeting proposals and we're very excited to have you all here and we so appreciate all the work that you put into this and all your thought and care about your community so we're looking forward to hearing what you uh, present to us and enjoy it and uh, don't be afraid of us. <laughs> So who would like to start with um, this? So George, we're going to have Aaron Hadeland, who's a teacher at the high school and teaches participa participation in government and social studies, introduce um, the students. And uh, we have four presentations this ah, evening. Terrific. So Aaron, if you want to kick it off. And I, I just want to thank Aaron for um, allowing us to go to Palum and I went to the school and we talked to students, um, tried to talk about local government a little bit and then um, ask them for help in deciding where we're going to put the participatory budgeting funds. Mm -hmm. um, and Erin's really carried the work on that along with her colleagues. So yeah, thank I'd, you. I'd also like to thank the council members that brought this up in the beginning um, and that actually seeing putting the money back in the people's hands and seeing how we best we can do it and what better place uh, is for the kids to decide the future. So thanks. All right, well, thank you. Um, so uh, good evening, and thank you guys again for the amazing opportunity uh, that you've extended to the students at Beacon High School. I'm sure you're just as excited as I am uh, to see this very first set of student presentations for the participatory budget. Um, I cannot think of a more amazing way for students to see firsthand just how they can impact their community directly. I want to thank the BHS administration for being so encouraging and for allowing this process to take place. Unfortunately, Mr. Dwyer is giving a presentation of his own presentation um, at the school board, so we, um, he could not be here. Um, most of all, um, I really want to recognize all the hard work that these young men and women have dedicated all of their time and their energy on their own to complete these presentations, to come up with the idea, um, and really have worked very hard to come up with ideas to better their community. Um, so you guys are really amazing, all of you. And I really appreciate that you guys all came. Thank you. Um, so good luck. Um, first is Dylan, right? So um, Dylan. Basketball. Basketball, yes. And Ben, can you please cue up the presentation? The process. Do you want to do the presentations first? Or oh, yeah. Process? Process? Yeah, we can do that. But it, it's not, we couldn't get it to work, I'm sorry. Just if the public, if the public wanted to know how these young people are getting these presentations before us, what process led to these four? Um, or after? Yeah, you want to discuss after? So sure. I, again, I, I think the, the context for people that are just tuning in is uh, we had approached the school about helping us with the participatory budgeting process. When we spoke, certain ideas were brought um, to our attention uh, when Paloma and I came, and then um, the teachers in the, the various classes followed up with students who were interested in promoting a particular idea. So what you have today are four ideas that were brought forth by students, developed by them. Some of them have even um, shown us where we could buy these. Um, and uh, we really appreciate the work that's going in. Um, what we thought is they could present these and then we can have a discussion about where you want to move forward on that. Um, and of course we can um, work with our parks uh, director to figure out how, how these might be implemented. So with that, thank you so much for coming and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. My name is Dylan Howard. I'm a senior at Beacon High School. I'm also on the varsity basketball team at That Matters. Um, and my proposal is, as you can see, new basketball hoops in Pekin. Um, my goal is to improve the quality of the city of Beacon's basketball hoops and courts, um, such as Memorial, Green Street, and Loopers, um, by removing the 
old basketball hoops that are now outdated and replacing them with more modern and um, enjoyable basketball hoops to play on, um, such as the ones that you could find at Lime Kiln Park in Fishkill. Um, that's just an example of some parks around here that have made the change to more modern basketball courts. Um, also, another goal of mine is to make sure that um, young kids like me are outside during the summer months playing basketball, not just sitting inside or like in, in an indoor court. It's more like preferable for kids to be playing outside during the summer. So, we can go to the next slide. Um, I just took a picture of Memorial Park just to show an example. And um, I took some pictures of the current conditions of the basketball hoops and courts at Memorial Park. As you can see, um, the net is falling off. Um, the, the backboard is deteriorating a little bit. It's pretty dirty. And um, the rims are triple rims, which are three rims stacked on top of each other, which is a lot harder to um, score on for a below average person, like basketball player, um, than a single rim with the glass backboard. And um, by replacing these, we I would expect more people to come out during the summer months and play outside as opposed to inside. You go to the next slide. Um, I took some more pictures. Uh, you can see the, the screws are getting rusted. And I took another picture of the backboard just to see another angle. Um, I also found some examples of basketball hoops that are more preferable to play on for people like me. Um, single rims, which are not the three rims stacked on top of each other. Um, glass backboards, and um, they are planted in the ground and are adjustable. So you can lower the height or higher the height. And on the next slide, I put some links. Um, these are not like limited to the only options, but these are some that I found um, that are better options for outdoor basketball hoops. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank and you. what we thought is after each presentation, if you have questions, why don't we do it while the presenter is still up there, and then, um, and then we can go on to the next one. Sure. The back of the preferable basketball um, goal, is it acrylic or glass? Um, it's, it it's acrylic. It's acrylic. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. And I guess in general for... I assume everyone knows what the budget is and what kind of money we're dealing with. So this, these are all within that range, I yes, assume? Yes, yeah. it would be in range. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, did you count how many hoops we need? Yeah. Good. Um, Good well, uh, we would probably start at Memorial Park because, you know, it's closest to the school um, and most people would prefer to play there. It would probably be convenient for everybody. So there are four rims currently at Memorial Park. And then at the other other um, parks I listed, there are two each. So in okay. total, it would be eight rims. Thank you. No and when you say that uh, these kind of rims uh, allow less um, talented, or I'm not sure what the word would be, basketball I, I players, but so by having these rims, it might encourage people that may have One felt of. they didn't play well on the current rims that they might play better, and it might encourage them yes, to be using the courts be, more often. Mm -hmm. yeah. These um, the, these other basketball rims, as opposed to the triple rims, they uh, make for an easier shot. So um, the current rims, like even me, I'm I would consider myself an above average basketball player. Um, it's it's harder to make a shot, especially when it's windy out. So by replacing these rims, I think it would give people more confidence to go out and learn how to play basketball and just have fun in the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. George, may I? And, and it's the rims are, are inflexible. When you have the three rims together, it's, it's pretty stiff, right? And the other ones get, have a little bit yes. more give and would work <coughs> with the ball, yeah. right? Um, the triple rims, they don't move at all. Yeah. And um, they're stiff. And sen since there's three stacked on top of each other, they're really like, their ball like bounces along, around a lot. Okay. It's, it's, it's a lot harder to make a shot. So um, these single rims, they have a little bit of give on them, but they usually do not break if you get the right um, hoop which I listed in the last slide, some good options. Cool. Thanks. And these, uh, these boards are adjustable so they can come down? 
Yeah. So I can dunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they can go up to 10 feet and down to about probably 6.5 feet. So All right, anyone, anyone would have a chance to score on them pretty much, <laughs> even a little kid. I would definitely still miss, but. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you some lessons if you need. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Well it was a great yeah. presentation. Thank you. I understand you're going to basketball practice now. Um, I, I actually missed basketball practice. Oh, here. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> My coach said it was fun. Right. It's a well, little rest day, I guess. Thank you for being here. No problem. Yeah, thanks yes. for having me. Good job. Thank you. To win. Uh, ben, what's the next one we have uh, ready to go? Uh, the pool proposal. Okay. Um, so this is Journey Fleming um, with the Beacon City Pool Proposal. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I worked at Beacon Pool as a lifeguard during the summer. Sorry, could you bring your microphone down so yeah, we can hear you better? Thanks. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I worked at Beacon Pool as a lifeguard during the summer. And it was my first job, and I didn't really think much of it, but when I saw the siding of the pool, it was sinking in, and I thought that was a safety hazard. And over time, I was like, maybe that's the drain area, and it's normal. But I was thinking if someone were to, someone were to jump on it or run across it, they can fall in. And I thought that would be really dangerous because we can get sued and someone can get extremely hurt. And I only have one slide. I couldn't get a picture because the pool is closed, but I'll read some of the bullet points I have. The side of the pool where the children walk, jump into the pool, sit or climb onto into the pool. In the shallow end near three to four feet and also at the next section in the beginning of four feet. When you press onto it, dirt comes up and it sinks. It feels like it's going to sink more over time. It could be more dangerous if someone were to jump on it extremely hard. And that's my presentation. Um, I appreciate that you came up with this from your experience working at the pool and seeing it um, every day. Uh, I think that's a really valuable perspective. Um, my question was, is if you were able to do any research about how much this would cost? No, but I think it'd probably be a few thousand dollars because the pools are very expensive and you would have to probably like take that part out and rebuild it. And there was two areas, so it'd probably take a long time. So I just want to make sure I understand what part of the pool we're talking about. This is the lining on the inside of yes. the pool? And dirt is coming out of it when people kind of inter interact with it? Yes, the okay. siding where people walk across or like enter on to step inside the pool. OK. And when they step in, it it moves the siding. Okay, thanks. Mm. Yes. Any other questions? Has 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 other people uh, alerted you to this, or is this something you observed personally? And uh, I observed it. Yeah. I observed it towards the end of the summer. I didn't notice anything of it until now mm -hmm. with the government costs. Mm -hmm. I would, I thought about it a few weeks later after the um, city council came. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm curious if you have noticed anyone who's tripped on it or expressed anything about it to follow up on what George asked. No, I didn't see anyone come over to ask about it, but I thought someone might this summer coming up because it's sinking a, a lot more than it was before. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. It, it seems like this is even though there's only been two presentations so far, but it's a pattern that, from your own experience, like uh, uh, Paloma was saying, that we, and once you begin to sort of focus on what you can improve, you focus on what you see every day and what you look at. And I think this is a great lesson for all of us in the community is, you know, you take your experience and you look closer and you think harder and what can be improved. So I think this is, this is really a great, um, you know, project that we're all doing together. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.
Ben, what do we have up next? Next up, we have the proposal for uh, water refill stations at the parks. Um, and this is Senin Scott Hamblin um, doing his presentation for refillable water stations. Uh, good evening, everyone. How are you guys? Good, good thank you. Thank you. Good. Welcome. All right, so my idea for the participatory budget is to have at least one refillable water station, water bottle filling station at each of the parks in Beacon. Um, I think it would benefit each park immensely because when you're at Memorial or any of the parks uh, over the summer specifically, you drink your water, you guys are all out having a fun day at the park with your family or whether you're exercising, playing basketball, whatever, if you go through your water bottle and you don't have another, you kind of either have to go to Ron's and buy a small cup or go all the way to Rite Aid on Main Street to go and buy another water bottle just to then go back to the park to try and continue going through your day. And I think if it were to happen that more re water bottle filling stations were in at specifically Memorial in general, because I don't know if you guys seen uh, if you guys have seen going by Memorial on a summer day. I I work at the school, so I walk to school and I'll see it during the summer, and it's filled with tons of people out there having playing volleyball, doing stuff with their family, and some people can't do that because they can't really afford to buy a bunch of water bottles to go to the park every day and with their kids and but if they could buy one bottle one water bottle and then continuously refill it and not have to leave or have to cut the day short or risk getting dehydrated and passing out um i think it would help immensely uh next slide this is just what some of them could look like. Uh, next one. Another aspect of it is the environmental impact. Um, I don't know if any of you know this statistic, but 60 million plastic bottles a day are put, are just in the US alone, are thrown out by people. And if we were to put stations to refill your water bottle in the parks, again, specifically Memorial or any of the others, it could help to cut down on that. And yeah, it may not. You may think in the grand scheme of it all, oh, what's one small town or city going to do? But it can help to lead other cities and towns into putting these stations in and implementing them into their parks. So you don't have to waste as much. And any questions? I'm curious if you have thoughts on where in each of these parks the water fountains might go. Um, the one I was focusing on mainly was Memorial, as I said. And I think by the one by the basketball hoops and maybe another one by the picnic tables where everyone goes to eat lunch and have fun, birthday parties, all that. I think if we had at least two in Memorial specifically, you mean the picnic tables by the bathroom and like yeah, the top? Yeah, right by there. Of the um, the different pictures you shared of other uh, versions of this, is there any particular version that you think is better of one over the other? Um, I think the first ones that I showed, the first two photos that I showed, would be the best because they look more modern. They have that more of a appeal to it, eye candy of sorts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I imagine these require uh, regular cleaning and some kind of maintenance? Yes. Uh, I did a little research just now into how much it would cost to do one, and it would be between 500 and $1,200 just to install one. To install, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> Including the fountain as well? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be all of it. Mm -hmm. And this would be something the, the highway department would be cleaning as they go through? or. 
Yeah, I mean, they, they maintain the park anyway. Yeah. So we do have fountains there that have been at various stages of disrepair. <laughs> I don't, are any of them working currently? I know I had them fix one of them last year. I actually, I guess this is a error in seeing them, but I haven't actually seen them really around there. Okay. And if I have, I probably, I know a lot of my friends and I have been at the park and been like, Man, it would be really nice if we could fill the water bottle and I have to, because me and all my friends don't have cars, so yeah. we can't, to walk to Rite Aid on a day where it's like 90 degrees, it's a lot harder. And the, the thing is, if we use the existing locations, we don't have to pay to repipe the, mm -hmm. the water. So we have water <coughs> service only to a few areas of that park, and if we... Um, you know, we could keep the cost down and, and probably install more if we stick with the locations that we have and just make sure they work. Mm -hmm. um, do all of our parks have uh, have water, Chris? No, no. Um, Riverfront, we don't have. Um, well, maybe there, there's a water fountain down there. I don't there. know that yeah. that's working. That's the <laughs> one I think that is working again. The one at Memorial Park is not. I'm okay. pretty sure. Yeah. What do we have at Green? I know we have the water for the restrooms. That's it. Yeah. Okay. But that would be close enough to be, you could just put it right by the restroom if you would. Yeah. yeah. And there's no shade in Green Street <coughs> Park yet. Right. We need those trees to grow a little more. So, okay. so what, what would you say the difference is between filling a water bottle at <coughs> one of these stations versus just a regular old water fountain? I would say the difference is easily accessible. So instead of having a line for a water fountain, you could quickly go fill up your water bottle and uh, walk away, go back to hanging out with your friends, your family, go back to playing volleyball, and you can keep drinking as you're doing those. Mm -hmm. And just also to have an easier reminder to do it. So instead of, the, it's a lot of people, it slips their mind and they'll have a water bottle, they'll just drink it constantly, but if they have to go to the water fountain, they'll kind of be like, oh, I'll do that in five minutes, mm -hmm. and then five minutes passes, and it's like, oh, I'll do it in another <clears throat> five minutes. Yeah, I don't know how, how many years ago it happened, and I just, ha I just noticed it one day. Uh, we here at City Hall replaced our water fountain with a water refilling station, and I, uh, I think I've used my water bottle, my plastic water bottle, for the last five months, and I usually come and... We're going to get with you one of these, George. I have one of them, but I always forget it, so I have this right. one in my bag, but I always refill it at this station. And, uh, and it's very quick um, and, um, uh, and very convenient as well. So I, I can see the value of it. Are those all the questions? Yeah. Well, Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, Ben, if you can cue up the last presentation, please. Absolutely. Finally, we have Jaden Drysdale and Karima Muhammad. Hello, I'm here representing the cemetery by Verplank. I think it's across from the St. John Church. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And the goal of it is to improve the overall care and appearance of the cemetery located in the corner of Verplank in North Walnut in the city of Beacon. Next slide. Um, I just compiled a bunch of photos that I that me and uh, Mrs. Hadlin had taken when we went there of just kind of stone piles, and we couldn't figure out if all of them were headstones or just rocks that people had found and put by the trees. But um, there was just seemed to be like a copious amount. Like there was like three or four different trees that looked like that. So we just wanted to see if they like, can get cleaned up or at least looked at to see if any of them are headstones and put them in the right place. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there seems to be many stone piles and stacks primarily. Yeah, again, there was a few different ones also just like centered up and some of them like the top one right there is, is definitely a headstone and but it's so like it has so much like moss and like a bunch of different stuff on it that we would just definitely have to get cleaned off before we even figure out where the rifle owner is. Um, yeah. The next slide please. Um, and then we've also found a f two or three different spots that looked like they had like started fencing or sectioned off areas, but they either never got continued or they were just for that family specifically because it was very limited. Even the parts that were started were never finished, but uh, they were more or less like the bare minimum. So we just kind of wanted to get them removed, if not 
at least partially finished and cleaned off because a lot of them are rusted over or just stuck to some stone and left all together. And it just didn't look the prettiest. <clears throat> Next thing, um, The fencing we were more looking into, at first that would probably be more affordable are just regular metal gates. But we were kind of looking into like all of the um, wrought iron and the cast irons because a lot of different cemeteries have them. Um, Dunning Street and St. Johnson, they both have them. And even though that one is a little bit smaller than the bottom picture, I feel like it would still be useful or at least be a little bit more presentable for respecting the dead. And the dead that you constantly pass at that, like my bus, I know my bus route and at least four others passes that route every single day. And it's just, there's no fencing, it's just on a hill and that's all. Next slide. There wasn't too many with graffiti on it, but I had just seen this one and I was like, um, and that can probably be cleaned with general maintenance, but same time, I just wanted to bring attention to that one that some of them are definitely easily cleanable, but still are messed with and tampered with. Uh, next slide, please. And then these are just a few more pictures of how they've either fallen over or somebody's placed them or messed with them. Or um, the one all the way to the right, it just looks like it just fell flat and it's just never been touched since. Not cleaned, not moved, not anything. So just wanted to get some of them at least cleaned or moved or pushed somewhere. And I think that's it. Have you uh, looked into the uh, the history of this uh, cemetery? Yeah, I was emailing back and forth with Emily Murnane and Mark Phillips on some of the history, and I don't remember a lot of it off the top of my head. It's kind of sitting in my like notes app on my mm -hmm. phone, but um, a lot of it dates back to this one couple that had came to Beacon, and they didn't even end up getting buried there, but a lot of like African American and Black uh, people ended up getting buried there. So yeah, from what I understand, there's also a few um, Civil War veterans, uh, yeah, African American Civil that. War veterans, uh, yeah. buried there. Um, do you know who who has ownership of the property? If I'm correct, it's the St. John Church. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to get in contact with them, and I left them a voicemail or two, but they never ended up getting back to me. Mark Phillips ended up getting back to me before they did, mm -hmm. um, so I was just in contact with him for a while, and he was explaining to me a lot of the history or how he was just taking care of it for a while. Um, but yeah, if I'm correct, it's them. Yeah, from, from what I can tell, it seems like a, it's mostly been a volunteer effort and just people have yeah. taken it upon themselves to do what they can, but without any official uh, commitment to it. Yeah. Yeah, he was just the, the county has the owner as the uh, Christ Methodist Church. I don't know if, and, and I know that they no longer are at the address that they were at when mm -hmm. that document was done. Um, do you... I, I thought when um, I, I heard that a group at the school was working with some of the people that might own or be involved in the cemetery, is that happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, BSU is looking more into how to, like, at least get a group of volunteers, whether from the school or outside of the school, to just go help and do a general cleanup of it before anybody else gets to it. Okay. Um, but I was just, with Mark Phillips, it was just a lot easier because I he was the person that was just doing the volunteer work for the longest amount of time and so it was just nice to hear from him that somebody was actually doing it and how to take care of it and how to do this this and this so little stuff like that a number of years ago I, I saw a group of um, 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 inmates from the prison they have a work program there where they come and maintain it occasionally I don't know how often that happens but yeah, I happen to see that yeah yeah, the um, cemetery behind the school, they do that for also, uh -huh. like behind the um, football field. Uh -huh. But I don't know how often they end up um, doing it for the Verplink one anymore. Right, right. So, um, hey, can people hear me? Yep, that's the mayor. Okay. Um, uh, this is uh, an interesting one. My recollection is there might actually be three cemeteries on that site uh, as opposed to one, and I think the Historical Society has a brochure on cemeteries and beacon where that gets explained. Uh, Drew, you seem to be nodding there. You, you know something about it, right? Yeah, so I actually refreshed myself on the history of this site prior to the meeting. You are correct. There are three cemeteries right there. One is owned by the Christ Methodist Church. One is owned by an unknown owner. And then the, the um, portion of the cemetery 
closest to Meliopatina Place is actually owned by the city. Um, and we took that property, I believe in 2019, uh, as part of an in ram. So there are um, headstones on that property as well. So, you know, it's definitely convenient to do work on city property, um, to do something on the portion in the middle owned by, right now it's just listed as private cemetery. We'd have to do some research about who that owner is um, and how we can get involved. And same thing with the Christ Methodist Church. It would take a little bit more research to figure out how the city can get involved and you know use public funds to renovate the cemetery. So we just have to look into it a little bit more this uh, because it's not city owned property, but we do think that there are possible avenues to using such public funds um, under general municipal law. Jaden, did you happen to look into the costs, uh, maybe particularly of the fencing, which looks like the more expensive thing on the list? Uh, well, the fencing overall would probably be around fifteen hundred to three thousand, and inputting it would probably, I want to say, add probably another five hundred to it, um, especially to get the entire like, well, the entirety of it. And now there's three, so mm -hmm. I don't know if we would be able to start it immediately. Of course, because we'd have to get jurisdiction from all three uh, parties. I see. Well, I also thought you might like to know that you referenced Dunning Street in Malta, New York. I grew up on Dunning Street in Malta, New York. So, <laughs> so you won me with this. No, yes, I love the coincidence. I was curious with the fencing, if you had an opinion about how accessible you, you want the future state of these cemeteries to be. Do you want people to feel that they can walk th into it and through it? Do you want it to be somewhere where it is more secluded and those who have relations in there, kind of what your overall thought was about the space? Uh, personally, probably a little bit of both. Um, I would like a fence on like each side of it, so probably like three fences for people to uh, easily like have easy access to because I know a lot of people just walk through it at the moment just to have a shortcut so I wouldn't want to like take that away from them but simultaneously have them like I want to have people be able to walk through it like casually and not have to be like a city official or something to just open it or go through it mm -hmm. but for that to have like some type of section to it so it's just its own space all right yeah yeah sometimes you're not necessarily aware if you're potentially stepping on yeah. where someone's buried Anybody else? No? I think I'm, I know this wasn't the focus of your presentation, but one of the parts that I found really <coughs> compelling um, about this space is who is potentially buried there. Um, I'm just curious if that is, I know that's not necessarily a budgetary um, concern, and so that's probably why you didn't put it in the presentation, um, but I'm curious if that is also an, an interest of yours. Um, I know one idea uh, that Chris had had, I think, was the potential of a historical marker. Um, so that people, you know, are aware of, of where they are and, and who's who's there. Yeah, yeah, most definitely that. Like you said, I didn't have it in the presentation, but um, I live in Hudson View, and like, there's a bunch of like markers all around. Even when you're coming in, there's like a huge one that you could read off of. Um, and I would definitely love one like on one of the corners of it, even if it's by like the Verplank sign itself. Um, and like I was saying before, I've been in contact with Emily Murnane and she runs the histor or helps run the historical center and she already has a lot of the information on it. It's just a matter of cleaning them and figuring out which one is which and less of like, we don't have all of the information, but it's less of like, um, who is this person and what's their history and more of we just need to get it cleaned and like properly put back together. If I remember correctly, there's when we were talking about the cemetery on Beekman, um, there's there's companies that specialize in this type of uh, cemetery restoration. If I recall correctly, right? Do you know about that? It's like I don't no? recall okay. that conversation. Well, it, it, was I, I assume, were, it was before yeah. you were here. I thought maybe okay. you knew of that type of work. And the, and the other thing to keep in mind is. Um, these ideas, even if we don't fund them, like we may not be able to fund this immediately, but we can, we can also figure out how we work with you. Like if you're doing a cleanup, we have trucks, and we might be able to take away the, you know, the debris, the brush, um, the leaves and stuff. Um, so, so again, I, I think the value in this is 
we only have ten thousand dollars and that only goes so far but all of these things are now on our radar so like the pool repairs <coughs> probably going to be more expensive than ten thousand um, but it but it gives us a, a better idea of what to add to our future capital plans mm -hmm. for improvements similarly with this we can figure out how we can integrate this maybe in our operations when they're doing cleanups mm -hmm. and also you know the more you look at something the more interesting it gets and you know like when if you figure brought, out if brought to people's attention the history of the place and you know the significant part of beacons history um, that's there it might encourage other people to you know put together groups of volunteers that maintain it and so on and um, so and, and I'll say I didn't know that we owned a property on the back side of that until you brought up the idea and sent in a presentation and then I went trying to figure out who owns what and it and here we own um, more than a half acre mm -hmm. on Melia Batina that backs up against these cemeteries so you, s you have some potential space there to work with for public spaces yeah, you know? yeah. I, th I think it was also discovered that there were some um, th there were some uh, bear there were some um, graves on that site as well because I believe someone around 2020 2021 there was a guy came here wanted remember? to build yeah, yeah 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 and they couldn't do it because it turned out there were graves yeah Is that right yeah, yeah I think within a certain distance or something yeah um, that's that's exactly correct uh, Dan we did a the city did a study in 2020 that someone kind of walked around and looked into the ground and discovered that there are actually bodies in the city's portion of the property Well, thank you very much. Uh, of it's great. Every thank one of you, you guys have done a fantastic job. <laughs> so, what, what do we do? We discuss further now, or do we? We, we could. It's uh, so it's on the agenda for tonight. Mm -hmm. You have your last voting meeting next Monday. So, if you wanted um, maybe to think about a, a prioritization that you would think. Um, then, then what I would do next is uh, go to the department heads that really make this happen and say, um, you know, do you think you can get this done within that budget? Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, if we, we can't, I think all of these are really, th this is a lot of great information for us to have yeah. and it's all actionable. Like we can figure out how to make um, some of these things happen outside of this process. Mm -hmm. So, so again, if you have ones that um, you want to set a prioritization for, we can, we can go as far down that list as we can get. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking as people were doing their presentations that, again, it's $10,000. It's not a lot of money relative to, I mean, it seems like a lot, $10,000 is still a lot of money. Um, but um, I'd like to think of it as what can we do with, for the most, the, the the greatest good, you know, that will affect the most people, um, and with a little bit of money, but um, what will have the most impact for this ten thousand dollars? How do we spread it out where um, a lot of people get to enjoy some aspect of it? Um, you know, and as three of these involve your parks, one of the other things we could do is I could work with Mark over the next few days to come up with a recommendation, and we could try to get some. Um, some numbers. Um, one of the one of the things that hits us is um, something might cost less for a private citizen who does it, but the city ends up paying prevailing wage for certain things, and um, it, it it sometimes gets a little more expensive than we initially think. So if you want me to vet that out and come back to next week's meeting with a list, then we could go through, or you could, you know, whatever you want to do. I think that would be good if we got more sort of tighter numbers on some of these things to see the practicality of it yeah I, I, I've been taking uh, note of some of the dollar amounts if it's helpful for folks um, the hoops would be eight times seven hundred and fifty dollars which is six thousand dollars the pool the cost is unknown right, right. Uh, the but reef probably expensive but probably yeah. expensive um, the refill stations are five to a thousand dollars each if we say they're a thousand dollars each that comes out to four thousand dollars we have three thousand dollars of fencing, but I, I'm not sure if we know how much fencing we would need until we figure out what we're putting the fence around. We would have to work out some of the yeah. 
legal stuff about the three different cemeteries. That's the that's the numbers. As a former contractor, I know that you get these numbers, then you forget all the other stuff that's involved in uh, in actually executing it. Like labor. Uh, labor. Yeah. <laughs> no labor here. Right. Yeah. But I think this is a great start, and yeah, I would love to have um, Mark's input on this and come back okay. next week with that. Yeah. Do we have a regular budget for pool maintenance? Yes. But probably not enough to cover this, or we need to take a look? Well, I heard initially back from our park director that this would be a much more substantial rebuild. Um, again, we and the city inherited the pool from the settlement camp, and we've uh, tried to keep it going without a major redo, which is can be you know in the many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so we've we've been able to get through with patching it and fixing it. At some point, we'll have to do a more solid investment in it. But, but again, I don't I don't have a lot of detail other than Mark thought it was going to be fairly expensive. But maybe there's something we could do in the interim to make sure it's safer than it is today. So. Love to do all four? Yeah. Yeah. That's always where we end up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to prioritize those from those four, I have to say. Well, I mean, the, uh, the other option, too, like we can talk to Mark and maybe you do a little bit of the hoops you know, a little bit, one of the stations, um, we, we look at what we can do with the pool, and then we, um, the, the, the one with the fencing is gonna take a little more time because we have to figure out the property interests. Mm -hmm. Who owns what, what are we allowed to do? Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I, I think the one about the, the cemetery, the fencing was part of it, but I, I got a sense that that wasn't the priority. Yeah. The, the priority is sort of a respect for the you know the stones and the and the you know the graves and so on and sort of bringing that back to life, uh, so to speak. Uh, so I, and I'd like to have a conversation with our DPW to understand what they do now. Like mm -hmm. we we own that back lot, so we're already over there, presumably mowing it mm -hmm. at some point. Um, so we I can also assess what we might be able to do in house without spending the ten thousand ten thousand right. dollars. I wonder what funding could be out there for, for that project as well. For the cemetery? Mm -hmm. Drew, do you, there's a part of general municipal law where cities take on abandoned um, cemeteries, isn't there? There is, in general municipal law 165 states that cities can, can maintain abandoned cemeteries that are the city's primary responsibility primary responsibility is not really a defined term so we have to dig deeper on what that means there's also another option where you can enter into agreements with um other cemetery corporations we're not sure if that applies to public or private and whether the church ownership by the church would count um if it does count you can just uh maintain it for them or enter into, into some sort of agreement so we do have to dig into those options and what the different and what the different options are because there are a couple out there general municipal law 165 and 165a kind of set that up for us and we just have to explore what that means what we can do what are the limitations but there is grants there are grants out there and funding available for um cemetery maintenance or cemetery improvements i don't know specifically who issues them but i do know that they exist yeah i think it's uh the secretary of state has a division on abandoned cemeteries or something so i think there might be some funding there never explored it but that's what i understand well we can do some research and um as you meet with the the um the historic folks and the volunteer coordinator um i'd love for you to um, bring me into one of those meetings so i can maybe see what opportunities we have to support those activities, you know, outside of $10,000. So we, I mean, we have trucks, we have equipment, we have staffing. Um, if you're doing a big cleanup, perhaps we can provide uh, some real support for that. So, um, Ms. Hadeland, you're welcome to give my number to uh, 
Yes, to your students. One thing I would like to hear a little more from Mark about, specifically like with the basketball hoops, is if maybe it's possible just to replace the backboards and the rims and not necessarily the poles as well, because I think Mark was saying that the poles have been replaced like five or six years ago, so those, those might be newer, and I mean, I imagine that would be a lot cheaper than also uninstalling and reinstalling new poles as well. Or maybe it's not cheaper to get specifically just a backboard and a rim. I don't know costs of basketball things, but I would love to hear Mark's insight on that. And if there is room in the budget to then do all of those and maybe you know, do another thing as well, I would love to just see Mark's uh, estimated price breakdown on all of this. OK, great. We'll get that for next week. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I was also curious about, and I didn't ask while you were presenting, I apologize, but um, I've seen, I mean, I think we have one in this building, the uh, dual water fountain and uh, water bottle filter dispensers, but I've only like seen those indoors. Do you know if there are any like models for outdoors as well? Because I think if there was an outdoor model that you know did both, I think that would be an excellent replacement for a water fountain. Um, I think that might be something good to look into. But even just in general, I think water to bottle dispensers are pretty great because, I mean, they're a little more hygienic than putting your mouth over a water fountain. And I think the answer is yes. They do have those. Okay. Yeah, the, the photos looked like they were all outdoors. Yeah, no, no, those were specifically just for water bottles, but I was talking about water bottle and water fountain dual combo like we have indoors like if dual. you don't have a bottle you can drink from it as well yeah, yeah I, I, I thought they, they were dual okay I yeah. didn't maybe I'd, I'll look again but um thank you oh look at that the and also, just, I mean, sorry. The end's, going, sh the end's going shopping right now. <laughs> yeah, it does. And l another, just another question. Do we know how well those work in uh, places with our climate where, you know, it gets cold, um, where we do have freezing temperatures? Um, yeah, I, w I would presume that we would um, shut the water to it at the end of October, early November, like we do with the bathrooms. We okay. basically um, have a shut off. That I'm, I'm guessing they'd probably shut it off maybe where it comes out of the street, there's a valve, and then we just empty it, and then you're, you're good till the spring. Yeah, the ones, the, we have them in most of our facilities now, we'll have them in the new firehouse, um, and it's great because it says how many bottles you've avoided using. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of fun watching that number run up. And starting any of these, what do you think like the timeline would be to just like get started like actually implementing any of these projects? Um, would that be more so starting in the spring? Um, I don't think know that any of these could be started in January. Maybe the fencing per se, if all of the logistics got figured out. But um, yeah. I mean, if we won't, I mean, I think this council's sort of excited to explore all of these. So I'm sort of wondering like, what could we start first? <laughs> Theoretically, I think your easiest one to implement is the basketball backboards and rims, and that could be that could be done right in the winter if you can get your your parts. I mean, we've had issues with supply chain disruptions, as Dan knows from like a year of waiting for equipment at Green Street. Um, but if if we can get them, they could be installed pretty readily in the spring. You could do the water fountains. I, I would wait till April. Um, the fencing, again, I, I would, um, I'm cautious about because I don't know how complex the property issues are. Yeah. Um, and then the pool, I would say we should do an assessment pretty quickly and figure out um, is there something we could do in the interim absent doing a new liner for the pool, which we did discuss. I mean, it's, it's, it's a major, I, I, I don't remember the number, but I know it was enough to tip our capital budget. Um, so we've tried to keep that um, kind of just patched and going for now. So. Yeah, so we'll come back to you next week. We'll do a little homework of and, and see what we can get.
And I, I really appreciate all of the feedback that I've had from um, Aaron's class. We, we, Paloma and I have a list of things that people have brought to our attention that includes some of these, but there's a lot of ideas that I think are going to continue to, you will look for opportunities how we can make some progress on them. Will, it, will this be an ongoing uh, project, you hope, or? Yeah. Okay, we put, we put another 10000 in the budget for next year. Good. Well, I think that money is in good hands. Uh, we'll find a good place to put it with your help. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate you taking the time to come tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. All right. And we'll let you know the outcome as well. So, uh, you'll see the mayor. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, y'all. Good night. And I hope you come back and lifeguard next year. We really yes. need lifeguards. Please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excellent. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Nice. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, that was really great. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe everyone knows. I should have brought this up when she was here, but Gretchen Dykstra, she's a local author, and she wrote this book on civic pioneers of people getting involved in their communities over the years. And so she gave everyone in that class a copy of this book when she oh, heard about cool. this project. Oh, that's wonderful. <clears throat> if you guys didn't get a copy, I know Gretchen, and I can make sure you got one. Okay. All right, so we've got um, a lot of appointments to make uh, going forward. Um, so the first appointment is of James Cottrell to the position of motor equipment operator. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to lump these next four together and just give you the context for it. We had a retirement this summer of an HMEO, and which is a heavy motor equipment operator. It's a higher level position. We backfilled it with an MEO at the time because that's what we really needed, kind of more on the ground. We, we have a, a couple people out on um, injuries. Um, we're now going to backfill that, and we had intended to come tonight to do that, and then we had a resignation a couple weeks ago of one of our best operators who's going to become a foreman uh, somewhere else. So it's a great opportunity for him, um, and we'll be filling two HMEO positions, and then that opens up two of the lower positions, the MEO. So tonight you have two heavy motor equipment operator, which is the higher skill job, and two motor equipment operators. Um, our, our DPW superintendent, um, Michael Manzi, and um, some of his staff and our HR director interviewed uh, James Cottrell and Edison um, Tenesaka, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, I wasn't in the interview. The, um, and they've made a recommendation to hire um, bo both of these gentlemen. Um, both of them have a lot of experience with tree work. Um, Edison is bilingual as well, and we've been trying to increase our bilingual staff um, so that when people are um, doing work, we, we have a lot of contractors that come in, and many of them um, have, have staff that are, you know, need some interpretation. So we think these are great opportunities to add to the department. And then on the HMEOs, we have two current MEOs, Chris Seguido and Zach Ross. Um, both were hired fairly recently, and ha both have really shown that they um, are adept at using these um, pieces of equipment. In fact, what we did, we had three people interested in, two, in the two positions, um, and we gave a test. We had five pieces of equipment that they tested on. Um, and it was very close, but we um, have two top candidates that we're going to be um, asking you to approve next week. We'll also have another HMEO probably coming up in March, so that third person um, definitely has, again, we, we go through staff and we try to advance our staff from the entry level positions right up uh, to the higher positions. Are they, are they for the HMEO, are they um, licensed by the state for that uh, level of um, equipment? Um, they have a CDL, yeah. They have a commercial driver's license that allows them to drive the bigger trucks that operate 
you know, the backhoes um, and, and some of the other equipment that we have. But yes, no, but, but so they, they all have... They all have the same license. The, MEO, the HMEOs, yeah, and okay. I believe the MEOs have that as well. Right, There's a couple right. different gradations of the commercial <coughs> driver's license, but they all met the, the civil service and our requirements. Mm -hmm. Yes. So those are our last hires for the year. Um, yeah. And it, it's a good time to get an HMEO on because um, snow, snow season has begun. Here it is. Yeah. And while I'm there, I just want to remind people, you have 24 hours to clear sidewalks and hydrants. Please do it within 24 hours after the end of the snowstorm. Any questions on those? You already mentioned this, but I appreciate that for the two new people who might be joining us, that they both bring that, that tree maintenance expertise. So uh, being a tree city, I'm making the assumption that there'll be opportunities for them to use and build on those skills. So yes. it's great to just have people with multiple skill sets joining us here. Thanks. Okay, okay then we'll go on to number five, um, or number six. Um, uh, number six. Yep. Yeah. Uh, reappointment of John Stella to the Board of Assessment Review. So the, the next five are appointments and reappointments. And what we've done, um, I've had Ben go back through our records, which are sometimes not as accessible as I would like, to figure out when people's terms of office expire. Um, we have a lot of expirations, and we'll be bringing you rounds of these. So what we tried to do tonight is do the three boards that have l real legal authority under our um, code and, and you know the, the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Planning Board, and the Board of Assessment. We're also going to have to reappoint a lot of the members of the CAC, HRC. Um, so Ben is still compiling. Um, some of those dates are not yet clear to us, so we're trying to figure out who those would be. Um, we wanted to get these in before the end of the year because they have meetings in January um, and are overseeing projects. So John Stella um, was elected as the chair of the Board of Investment uh, Assessment Review. This board really only meets a couple times a year around the, um, the assessment day, and they um, listen to people that challenge their assessments, consider any facts that they bring, um, about the valuation of the property, and they help make recommendations and um, to the assessor about whether or not to adjust that assessment. Chris, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Was he elected or appointed? I'm sorry, both. So he's a, he's appointed to the board of assessment, and then the board of assessment elected a chair. Okay, thank yeah. you for the clarification. Um, so we asked we asked him if he would um, come back on the board because it's. Um, it's nice when you have somebody that really knows the process and we spoke to the assessor and she was um, delighted to have him come back. A point of clarification, I noticed there was not a resume for him but there were for the other people and I just didn't know what's, what's required for our positions like this. When we have somebody new coming in that we don't know, we definitely ask for a resume. Um, we just didn't have time to get his resume so I asked Kathy Martin, our assessor, to do a memo uh, speaking to his qualification. Okay, would great. It be, would it be possible to get a resume before next Monday when we vote? Um, I don't know. Okay. See, some, some folks don't have a resume ready to go, so if you haven't done a job in a long, we, we have people that have served, and some people, you know, keep their resumes up to date. Um, others that are on. John Stell is retired. Okay. Uh, but, but it would still be helpful to know his qualifications um, and to have that be in the public record. I, again, I don't know if he has a resume. We've had some difficulty getting a resume on this. Uh, maybe <coughs> he could just uh, email a list of where he's worked. Um, again, I, I don't know what I can get. Um, I, I, I know that he he was qualified enough that he was appointed before. I, I presume that when you've had somebody on a board who has served successfully on that board, um, who's recommended by the staff that they interact with, 
um, that that's less critical than somebody new that you're trying to gauge if they have the qualification. You have somebody that had the respect of his peers enough that he actually was made chair. Um, you know, again, if, if you're retired and you're offering your services to the city to do this and we make it onerous, um, we, we asked him the favor to do this again. So I, w I, want, I want to be clear, like if we're going to make it so, you know, we chase people away because we, we want to have a, a resume and they may not have a resume, I, I think you're going to have trouble getting volunteers. I don't, I don't think we're insisting on a resume, we just want to know the qualifications. Just yeah, I, I don't see why it's so terribly onerous to just list where you've worked. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a graphic design fancy resume. I don't need to know everything about you. But we, we can request it. I don't know if you'll get it. But I, I do also want to say I agree that it is more important for new people to have that background. And I, I do personally um, see the support of his peers and the support of our assessor as, as much more important than a list of qualifications. Uh, I just think that it's also important. Is it true for all our boards that they, they vote on the, uh, who? Um, no, it depends on the board. Is it just the um, Board of Appeals? Okay. Otherwise, they're appointed by the mayor. Yep, sure. George, and that's typically set forth in the, uh, city, the city code. So we're gonna take yeah, I, I just want to say, like, we didn't know if he would do this again. Mm -hmm. So I, I think sometimes you need to think like you're asking somebody to give a lot of time. Uh, somebody's retired, they might just say, "Yeah, you know, it's not worth it." Yeah. So um, uh, we have two reappointments to the planning board. We realize that John Gunn and Kevin Burns' terms are up. We also have a third term that is, um, we have a third opening from the resignation of J.C. Calderon, who resigned back in the fall. Um, so we have, uh, we have resumes for all three of these. John Gunn currently serves as the chair. Kevin Byrne is on. David Jensen currently serves as the um, chair of the ZBA and the mayor asked if he would consider moving to the planning board. He did agree to do that, which is why you have that last appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that, that would open up a, a spot on the ZBA. And would there be someone to fill the chair position at the, on the ZBA? On the ZBA, um, yes. Uh, so the, the current deputy chair is Jordan Hogg. Um, and he, he's willing to step up and become the chair. And he, he does chair the meetings now when um, David is not there. Mm -hmm. And Drew, you've worked with him and had good experience, correct? Absolutely. Jordan's actually been on the board uh, longer than David. He was hesitant to step up as the chair previously, but I think he's ready now. I'm, I enjoy working with him and, and all the members on the ZBA. They're great. And, and Jordan is an attorney and has a lot of background in land use. And for Mr. Gunn, is this a reappointment to chair or just a reappointment to the board? Um, Mayor, can you chime in on that? I would to be the to also to chair the board. So John's done uh, both of our comprehensive plans and uh, has been an architect who doesn't work in Beacon, so there's never been a conflict. So. Um, you know, I think he's guided us through a lot over the years, so, uh, and he's still willing to do it, so, uh, yeah. And this is one of those, to George's question earlier, one of the chair appointments that the mayor does as opposed to the, the members of the committee then choose their chair, am I understanding that correctly? Drew, I'm going to ask you to take that one. I believe that to be the case. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, am I still muted? Oh, no, I'm not. Yeah, you were <laughs> muted. Uh, yes, the, the mayor appoints the chairman to the planning board and to the ZBA. Great, thank you. Were there any other applications uh, considered for the, uh, sorry, planning board? Or submitted at even? Let me just start there. Ben, 
can you confirm I don't re recall that we had any other applications since pre COVID I have but submitted a few questions for the planning board correct yes yes yeah, so, uh, when we had some openings come up earlier this year and we were starting to figure out the plan going forward uh, we went through all the ones we had on file. Most of them were old. I don't think we had any that had been received since I've been here um, that were specifically for the planning board. We, you know, we get applications every so often, um, but you have to check boxes um, for what you're interested in serving on. Uh, we've had a number we brought to you for tree committee, CAC. I do not believe offhand that I recall any that came in that were specifically applying for planning board. Uh, other than David Jensen. Correct. And Ben has been here a year tomorrow. Really? Yes. Congratulations. Congrats, Ben. Oh, it's been a long Thank time. you. That was tomorrow was our training session that I met you all at it as well. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. a lot of us are very aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> One year. So, Mr. Gunn drew the ire of the public a couple of months ago, uh, making a comment um, that on the surface seemed to. Uh, not really respect the public's input on a couple projects and also um, seem to uh, suggest that the planning board was uh, helpless in influencing projects and uh, we've gotten letters from people about those remarks over the last couple months. Um, Lee, how do you reconcile those comments with this, uh, this reappointment? Um, so you know, anytime that there's a controversial project, um, people will come out and want a specific answer. Um, you know, to the extent that um, I believe what occurred, and maybe Drew can help me out here, uh, to the extent that uh, any statements were made regarding what legally could and couldn't occur was either corrected or trained if it wasn't correct. I'm not actually sure uh, as to the statements. Maybe Drew can help me out on that. Mayor, yeah, I was not uh, present at that meeting, so I don't know the exact statements. I did talk to Jennifer Gray, knowing that John Gunn was on the agenda tonight, as well as some of the other planning board members. She speaks very highly of John. I've also sat with the planning board several times. John is well aware of the, the procedures. He's very good at taking public comments. Um, you know, even when these meetings, especially recently, have gone till one in the morning, which really pushes a chairman to their limits. But, you know, he for the most part stays level-headed and is really good about um, you know knowing the rules knowing the standards and you know going through these applications so but I don't know specifically what was said in any letters or what was said at any recent meetings mm -hmm. thank you <clears throat> well, I just from experience I had the opportunity and I can't believe he's been on there as long as longer than I've been on City Council but I served with John Gunn uh, <laughs> 16 years ago and he's been on there ever since and uh, having been on the council for 13 years on the planning board for two I could say the planning board takes a great amount of effort and we are lucky to have this kind of institutional knowledge this kind of experience um, on there and and I believe chairing as well and it's difficult and you're you, you're on a board for that long you're gonna make enemies you're gonna lose your temper occasionally you might be maybe not the most diplomatic sometimes but I think we're we're truly lucky to have him as the as the chairman and certainly on the board itself so I would endorse him 100 percent I think we all have a responsibility to see that those trainings take place that Jennifer Gray mentioned um, but you know just if it were any of us or if it were you know, an actual employee, we would want to see um, opportunity for growth and learning more than just, um, you know, losing all of this experience. The value of resumes, I have to say, um, John Gunn, his resume is, I mean, 30, 40 years in architecture and, you know, Gensler, one of the biggest architecture firms, I think, in the country. I mean, he's, you know, um, at least on paper, and not saying nothing else of the 1 a.m. meetings and serving with multiple boards over the years it seems like a lot to recommend and I know from talking to staff that our staff has been um, 
stressed by the length of the meetings and the workload of these meetings. We've ha we had one meeting, and, it, and I actually think it might have been the one at which um, some of these statements were made where there were seven public hearings, and that's an awful lot to sit through. Um, they, they often have gone past 11 and in one case went to 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, so again, I think you have you have some great volunteers, and they um, they've had a lot on their plates because not a lot was happening during COVID, and and there was this backlog. So this this planning board has had a lot of work this year. Yeah, and one of the things we did after that session, um, Chris and I met um, just to discuss uh, with the the chair how we might um, kind of schedule the agenda so we're not burning them out because it was you know one of the mornings just not sustainable especially for someone that then takes the train into the city the next morning uh, so we did that and then we also had jennifer you know sort of do some clarifications as to you know how where the purview of the board is where they have some flexibility where they don't and, and a lot of communities will do two meetings a month so but but again that that's a trade-off like sometimes People just want to do that one meeting a month and be done. Um, and, and there is a lot to review before they even, they're doing calls in advance, so. Um. I want to say that I do really appreciate all of the experience that um, I, I see in this resume that's being brought to the table. I also just, I, th I think it's important for me to acknowledge um, the voices of my constituents and um, I've heard from a lot of different people um, in, in the gym in, in ward meetings um, on the street in the market um, at the farmers market in key foods um, just very upset at interactions that they've had with the planning board and I think it's you know um, I, I, I while I, I recognize this experience and I really want to uh, state the value in, in volunteering the time and the long nights that are being spent and how uh, exhausting that can be. I also recognize what it's like to be on that side of the podium and to, to bring something to a council that you care very deeply about um, that's impacting your day-to-day -day living. And I just want to make sure that as we move forward with um, all of these appointments and boards, um, especially the planning board, which has been a hot button topic that we are um, considering the needs of the people in our community right now. Um, and that, um, it, you know, if we are moving forward with the same people, if there aren't any other applications and um, that we, I don't know, we find a way to move forward and, uh, that's not, I don't know if, I don't want to say controversial, but, um, you know, in a, in a way that's a little more... Um, transparent? Transparent, for sure. Um, transparent and, um, you know, I, I just, I want to make sure that the people that are coming feel like they're heard. And I think that's something that I've heard again and again, um, that people feel like they're being dismissed. And um, maybe that's just something that can be addressed with an individual or individuals on the planning board and doesn't require any any change of heads per se, but just maybe um, a change in, I don't know, the way certain things are approached. And I also recognize it's a two-way street. Um, but then also, yeah, just some more transparency in how these appointments um, happen and what other applications are added. But um, I appreciate you, uh, Ben and Chris, telling us that these, these were the only applications inputted. Um, and again, I do really appreciate the volunteer hours that are put into the planning board, because I know I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to really be mindful and take into consideration what people have been saying and figure out how to make sure people feel like they're being heard. Um. I'm, I'm confident the mayor and I can have another conversation with uh, the chair about that.
Um, the, the only thing that I will add in a, an agreement to what Justice and others have shared is that I know Paloma, a meeting or two ago, brought up the idea of, of some of the trainings that are at the City Council. Actually, I had a chance to talk with, with Pete um, about ways we can tag them in YouTube, because I think in the planning board meetings that I've watched, one of the things that's true is that part of what the public seems to be experiencing is that it's a very technical process, that they know there's this thing in their neighborhood they have questions and concerns about, but how best to insert themselves, like the difference between a secret hearing and a public hearing, I can understand it must drive John Gunn up a wall that people are saying things at one meeting they should be saying in another or another public hearing, but like, but the reality people don't know. And so I'm just wondering if there's ways we can invite people into this space so they know where to best put their stuff so that that level of frustration with these long meetings doesn't kind of ratchet up. So, so I appreciate Chris, you and, and Lee kind of working with John Gunn and the rest of the planning board about ways we can structure the board and then also maybe making some of these trainings available so that everyone involved, even if they have different ideas and opinions, th that doesn't just add on top of the stress. And I've spoken to the building inspector about um, doing what we said and, and kind of taking the videos, extracting those out of the main meeting and then putting them um, with, a, with titles so that you can easily access like, okay, here's, a, here's CICRA 101 or mm -hmm. here's how, how we do subdivisions. Um, so we're trying to make those more accessible. It's going to take a little bit of time because we, we do need Pete to extract right. those for yeah. us. Um, but it's in, I would say it's starting and in process and a goal that we're going to mm -hmm. move towards. Great. No, I appreciate you doing that because I think sometimes as a member of the public, if that's not available, you can feel like something's being hidden from you because these are such expensive large projects. So the more we can make it, to use Paloma's word, as transparent, as possible, the more we can help bridge that that divide that currently exists. Yeah, and it's, and it's it's such a difficult area. I mean, as a when I was a councilman, I did a couple of zoning 101 uh, sessions over at the Beehive just to help people understand how zoning works. And you know, we were working on some zoning changes, but the, this the planning board's in some respects harder because um, you know the council sets the zoning, not the planning board, and then. From that, the planning board has certain powers, but then also not others. And that's oftentimes kind of hard to explain, which kind of makes it arcane. One of the things I could hear is, is when you're, there's a, a difficult one, and it's sometimes hard to know up front, maybe Jennifer or whatever legal support that we have there can kind of take through, you know, here's what the zoning says, here are the areas that the planning board can focus on, or here's what the secret hearing can focus on, here's what this piece does in terms of site plan, but something like that, because, you know, people don't have a perspective as to, you know, what is it that I'm supposed to um, focus on if I'm pro or against something, what's within the powers, you know, to, to move, you know, and what's on some stuff that isn't because it's part of the zoning law as opposed to what the planning board does. That sounds great, Lee. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah, let, me, let, us, we'll, let us talk to Jennifer. I think that's a good one. And happy to have a conversation with John about, you know, how do we kind of engage the public a little bit. Um, I know they do trainings, you know, in that half hour beforehand. Maybe we invite the public, but i um, happy to work on that because, you know, we don't want to have a tough planning board process, you know, not for the community and not for the board because it's part of them. But let, let's, you know, we've had that conversation with the chair, with Jennifer. Let's keep working on that because I, I think um, that will be a positive outcome for everyone. Um, I just wanted to bring one more tr transparency because that's apparently the theme uh, question. Um, in general, I think this is something that we've asked for and I think this is a more complicated um, thing to accomplish than, than one might, be, might think, but just a list of the vacancies on all of the boards. We're close. Yeah, I, I assume that's what you're talking about, about we don't even know what people's terms are. Yes. We're figuring that out. Yeah, and ben, ben has almost a complete list at this point. Um, the, what we're missing in some cases is the date. We don't have the date of appointment. Um, no one recorded what the term was. Um, in some, like 
almost half of the CAC is expired, including the chair. Oops. Yeah. So we're, we're going to try to get ahead of this. Again, now that yeah. we have been, um, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's really uh, helped me catch up on these things. Yeah, because I think part of this, um, the transparency and, and the perhaps potential lack of applications is, is one that the job is incredibly difficult and it's all volunteer. Um, but also, uh, when I talk to people, they don't always know sort of what's happening, which vacancies are, what the qualifications are. These resumes are very helpful. Um, and a next level I think that would be really helpful is a list of what um, what it is that we're looking for in each of these positions. You know, I don't want to be too greedy and we want to get people who will just do it <laughs> on a certain level. Like we are, like you've mentioned, we are asking people to do it because no one's coming to us. Um, but I still think there are ways that we can make um, the application process um, a little more clear um, and a little more accessible. Yeah. I'm hoping we have that list for you for the meetings in January. One specific thing, and sorry, Chris, this might not be helpful right now, but I believe the current application, you, it's hard copy, and I'm wondering if, if maybe next year, the year after, can make it an online application, so you can like fill it in like a Google form or whatever is the appropriate form. Because um, I, I applied yeah. for one a year ago, and I think I had to like print something out and fill it in. So I think there might be something on the website. There is something that's a fillable, it's a fillable form. PDF. Yeah. A it's fillable PDF. A oh, but it's not like a, a, a Google, Google survey thing. Yeah. yeah. So for some people, that might be less accessible. I appreciate we still want the hard copy for those who prefer that. Um, but that might be something that people feel they can fill it out. Ben, yeah. do we get hard copies, or can you just fill it out online? Uh, you can fill it out on a digital copy online. A lot of them that I've received have been by email. Uh, and we've gotten a couple dropped off at the window, but for the most part, people will email them to me. And I believe, don't quote me for sure on this, but I believe the form itself has the email where you can send it to on it. We, we, we'll we oh, try to make it indeed. easier to put in. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, thank you. I'm we've wondering. Been, we've yeah. been cleaning up the website, too. So again, it's part of a... Yeah, this, this is not a like top priority, but yeah. I, it would be, you know, I think again, it's we want people to it to be as accessible as possible. And then like, and then it might be easier to add what Paloma was saying, if there are specific skills that we were thinking of or that we kind of describe the position, um, yeah, build that out over time. You know, and when we, um, you know, we had a, we had a, a PowerPoint presentation late spring, early summer, was it? I was just looking for it, I couldn't find it. It was a presentation by Ben of all the committees and all the vacancies, and there weren't many at the time except for the HRC, if I recall. But, you know, we don't, when we want an update on that, I don't think we need to have a big presentation every time. We, in the last council, we had a shared drive where um, all of the applications were put and a tracker of all of the applications and the list of everything, and any time we wanted to go back to it to reference it, we could just open, go to the shared drive. Um, so we could just do some go back to something like that instead of doing big, you know, like presentations. And stuff too. Yeah, and I, I I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we did the presentation too, um, a to get our minds around what the status of each committee was, and then it kind of gave you context. Like there's different tranches of of these committees. You have some that are set up by code and, and or, or general municipal law, and then you have others that are ad hoc. So we were trying to give a sense, kind of the context of it as well. But it, I think we have a pretty complete list. I, I think I'm just missing dates at this point. So we'll get that back up and get it out to you. And then you can let people know, yeah, we've got, you know, tree committee, CAC, um, HRC is, has openings. Um, Okay. Do we go on to 11 now? I think we're on 11. Um, with Brown and Brown Incorporated for Brown the and Brown. insurance yeah, so, services. Um, the city, one of the, one of the major expenses uh, the city undertakes each year is to insure all of the buildings, vehicles, equipment um, that we have and also to cover our own liability. We um, have a number of lawsuits every year of everything from people tripping and falling to 
on sidewalks that we don't have responsibility for to traffic accidents that um, you know we're somehow deemed to be at risk at fault about um, we um, have been in the NIMER program NIMER it stands for New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal. It's a nonprofit um, insurance, basically like a cooperative of governments. They got to got together to um, aggregate the insurance needs of municipalities around New York State so that they could get better prices. The broker for Nimer in this region is Brown and Brown, which some of you who were on the council for years new as the Splain Agency or Spain Agency. Um, so they, they're retitled. Um, this year's premium goes up uh, about 8%. And is, as you can see on the premiums, um, one of the main drivers of that is cybersecurity. The number in here is a kind of not to exceed. And I'm still having nine, uh, I'm having Brown and Brown evaluate other options for cybersecurity. Um, that might be less expensive and we're working with our IT consultant to see what exactly he he deems as being our our risk and trying to figure out how to right size that um, again this this goes through property behind this premium is a list of all of our buildings all of our infrastructure like our pipes our tanks you know water tanks dams um, Every, every facility that we own and a list of all vehicles. So we don't typically put that out publicly because um, I, some of that infrastructure, I, I don't want to necessarily identify where everything is. Um, and we were advised by the attorney not, not to do that. Um, so this year we're, um, we're going to be going up a little bit. We have budgeted for it. Um, you'll see in the budget amendments, we actually had an increase last year, too, that we're going to have to backfill. Um, so I'm trying to get these in in December. We had typically done them later, and then, you know, they gave us, like, an extension of the policy. Um, so that's why I'm trying to bring this at the end of the year to get have it in place for January 1. It's a one-year policy. Um, we get good service from them, so when I'm looking for insurance certificates or if I have a contract um, and I'm wondering if our insurance requirements are sufficient, I, uh, Brown & Brown helps me with that. They also provide us risk management inspection services. So they went through our facilities. They gave us recommendations. They looked at some of our processes. Uh, they work with our HR and making sure that we have training materials. Um, so um, we, we've had good service with them and I'd like to use them again next year. Chris, I am curious, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this by our next meeting about cyber. It sounds like you're having our IT person look into it about why it went up so much. I was wondering, even though we didn't start doing this last year, if it's related to the fact that we started uh, allowing online payments uh, and right. there's something about storing credit card numbers. No, it, I do know why it went up. I just, I, I don't know what my alternatives are. Essentially, what we had through NIMER was, they describe it as a light blanket. It didn't, it didn't really give a ton of coverage. Mm. Um, based on some of the ransomware and the other intrusions that they've seen for uh, government entities, they, they, they're proposing that we go up to a higher level so that when there is um, you know, a ransomware attack or, or some other um, intrusion into our system, the company actually will help us fight that off. They'll, they'll intercede right away to help limit the damage. So they'll work with our IT specialist. Um, so it's a, it's a more robust coverage than I think we had last year. And it's just recognizing that these attacks are, are happening and they're happening not just to the biggest cities, but they're happening to other localities. Yeah, I'm wondering if you might not know off the top of your head if there are examples of smaller municipalities this has happened to. It, ju it just helps for the public to know, like, this is why we think it's worth spending this yes. extra amount of money if we have examples of, like, oh, this other town had this happen and here was the consequence for them. Um, if, if, if you're able to get that for next time, that yeah, would be great. I'll try to get that. I don't know any municipalities off of my hand, per se, but as far as, like, government entities uh, go, I think... Uh, 
I, I might be wrong, uh, but the Schenectady Library or a library, there was a public library that got hit by ransomware and it was really bad. Um, and that was about a year or so ago and I've seen attacks happening frequently. I mean, just for the public's sake, uh, I work at a public library outside of city council and um, we've seen ransomware attacks just through our dis book distributors as well. And um, it's, it's happening quite frequently, uh, quite often, and it can be very damaging. So I think this, it, it is good to invest and be prepared. And they, what they told me is they have these uh, breach co coaches, so if you have a breach of your data, um, they, they can work with you to recover it, to protect other pieces of your system. I need to talk to our IT guy more about how much he has backed up already, and then we can make a calculation to maybe have a lower cost insurance policy because we have a higher deductible. If we know our risk is relatively low in an area, we, we may be able to increase the deductible, and that, that helps to bring the overall cost down. Great. It was Syracuse. Okay. Um, so the, the next contract is um, a contract with WSP USA, which is an engineering consultant. This is uh, for the Fishkill Avenue, Teller Avenue rehabilitation project. This is a project that started back in 2001, and we are um, looking forward to getting it out to bid in January. Um, we are fully designed, we are fully approved by DOT. Fishkill Avenue, the funding has been approved, and that's um, over $8 million in funding. Um, I'm sorry, that piece of it is $6 million. Um, the Teller Avenue piece, because we got additional money from the state, they needed, we put money from Teller Avenue into Fishkill Avenue in the last federal fiscal year, which ended on September 30th. Then for the new federal fiscal year, which started October 1, the Dutchess County Transportation Council helped us by backfilling that. We're waiting for a final state approval on that and then hope to have authorization, but it looks like we should be able to bid the project <coughs> in January with the hope of starting construction in late March or April. Um, the, the duration of the um, construction is probably going to be around 18 months. It's a lot of work. Um, and the, the cost of the um, construction inspection is partially a function of how long it goes. And um, when you do these DOT projects that are funded by state and uh, federal money, and this project, again, is 95% federal and state, they require you to have a full-time construction inspector on site, making sure that the work's being done to the DOT standard. Um, so there's a proposal here uh, from WSP, which designed the project and has worked on it for a long time, uh, for $1,449,746. Um, and I'd like to get that in place because when we go to bid, there are questions that inevitably come up from prospective bidders about interpretations of the plans, and I want to have them on. Um, we're, we've basically expended all of the money from the design contract, so to have some bid support services too, that's been included in that contract. Um, okay, the next one is a bid award to United Safety LLC. Um, we put out to bid in November. The Sorry, Chris, uh, before we move on for that, is would WSP also be responsible or have they already put together what the plan is in terms of how traffic will be managed? Like are they doing one section first and then another? Will it all be closed down? Or is that something that's not decided until later by another one of these contractors? Yeah, it's the, it's the latter. Okay. So when, once we put this out to bid, we'll have pre-construction meetings with the firm that we end up hiring. They'll talk out with the city and our representatives at WSP um, how, they, how they view the, the project progressing. Some of it may depend on utility uh, relocations. We've been meeting in the field with Verizon, uh, Altice, uh, Crown Castle, two other smaller uh, cable companies that have um, 
wires on some of these poles that need to be moved. So whether or not they get moved may depend on which end we begin on and how we face the project. As part of the, the job, the contractor has to maintain at least one lane open um, and they have to do all traffic control. So they're responsible for that, but they, they'll come up with a schedule then and they'll come up, th their means and methods they, they figure out, um, but they have to have the project done by November of 2024. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a big project. It, it includes sewer work, too, um, which um, I think is going to add a little bit of a, a little bit of extra time, too, because we've been having trouble ordering parts uh, when we've been doing that. Um, so the next, the next one is um, related to the Beacon Fire Station rehabilitation. Um, we found that there were asbestos containing materials I'm sorry Lee were you trying to okay um, there we found that there are asbestos containing materials in the building um, that need to be removed we did a bid we had a great bid response we had eight vendors um, bid on this project the low bid was from United Safety LLC for $132,200. We had two bids that were uh, just a few thousand dollars above that. So we, we had a competitive price. I think um, it came under budget from, we had initially put in $160,000 in the budget. Um, and I think the reason that we, we came in under is initially we thought we'd still have the fire department operating at a part of the building. And we decided at a point that that probably wasn't wise and we're clearing the building. Um, so th this is great. This work will start in January and then we are aiming to bid the reconstruction of the firehouse um, on January 31st. So we're, um, we're hopefully going to be in the ground working by April. Great. Chris, was there any lead to be abated? <coughs> It was built after lead paint, right? Tompkins Hose was built in the 80s and lead paint went out in 76, I Right. Think. There, we didn't have it in the paint. We, there, there are some in some of the plumbing fittings that okay. could be happening. Because I know we have, um, um, we have them opening some of the walls to investigate further. And then we have like a unit price when they remove some of those lead fittings. OK, thanks. Um, but it, it's primarily asbestos tile, and we could have encapsulated it, but we decided to try to get it out of there and just have a clean building so that when we do renovations in the future, nobody's got to wonder, okay, well, where did they leave asbestos? Um, okay. Um, we have a series of five amendments, all of which are to the uh, general fund, um, and I'll walk through these. We are going to have probably one last round of amendments in January to close the book. So um, uh, the first one of these is for police overtime. It's transferring 63000 to overtime from the regular salary lines. Um, we've talked about this more than a few times. We've had up to six vacancies um, this year. We've now hired three new people. Um, so there are a lot of the regular salaries that we didn't expend because we simply didn't have people, and then we had to cover those shifts with overtime. Um, so the the bad news is we're spending sixty three thousand more on overtime. The good news is over the past months the chief and I have worked to really bring down the rate at which we're spending overtime, um, and I'm going to try to carry that forward into twenty twenty three. So we're being <coughs> very selective about when. We um, have discretionary overtime for events and, and other things. Um, some of it's unavoidable, like when we do trainings, they, ha they have to use overtime to do these trainings because they can't be in the middle of a training and have to run to a response. Um, the, sec the second item. Um, sorry, sorry, one thing. I thought we hired four police officers this year, or was one of them a detective? I think you did a promotion, and then you did three hires. So we did Jonathan. Underwood, Nick, Anzavino, and then uh, Jerome Burton. Right. Um, and then I think I think the last hire before that was in was November, early. December last year, and it was. Um, I thought it was early in the year. I thought it was over the winter. Anyway. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I, I think we only did three this year. And we've been hiring off the beacon list, which we've now exhausted, and we're moving to the county list. So we are going to try to hire three additional police officers before the police academy begins next March. So I talked to the chief today, and he's, um, we've sent out canva what's called a canvas letter, which invites people who um, got certain scores on tests saying, hey, we're hiring, would you like to apply? And that's the next step for us. We don't have to take the top three? <coughs> well, the top three are the top, often um, you go down through scores. Mm -hmm. So like you could have 40 people that got 100. Um, and so you would take all the hundreds. Oh, and then you would go to the 95s and you might have 35 95s. Um, so you work your way down. And often what we do when we canvas is we'll try to figure out how many do we have to actually canvas down to. Um, just because you canvas them doesn't mean you have to hire them. And then what we'll see is how many of the hundred, you know, pe people have already been hiring off this list, so you'll find um, a lot of them may have already been hired by other departments. Is this a relatively new list? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Good. yeah so we're going to work the list as quickly as we can. Um, <coughs> the second item is also in the police budget. It's crossing guards. You may remember last year we had um, an issue where we had almost half of our postings unfilled. Um, we were not paying very much. We were paying $15 an hour. I raised the pay to uh, $20 an hour. If you work both shifts, you get 20 in the morning and 20 in the afternoon. If you just do, we, we were having trouble with um, the afternoon shift. So if you just work the morning, then you get 18. But it's helped us fill all of these positions. Um, we, we did just lose somebody, so we may um, be back filling, but we're doing a lot better than last year. But there was a little bit of an extra cost to that. And again, I, I think we saved that money on highway and police overtime because we had to backfill it with mostly highway workers when uh, we didn't have people showing up, particularly for the afternoon. So if a, if a crossing guard calls in sick, um, the highway department fills in for them? Well, that was what was happening. Now we actually have um, some substitutes uh -huh. to fill in. So we'll try the, the two or three alternate alternates that we have then the next would be highway, and if we don't get anybody from highway, then we would go to police. But we've gotten, we've, we've not had to go to police for a long time on okay. this. <coughs> I found it. We gave a promotion to Trevor Wood from police yes. officer to detective yes. in May. Cool. Yeah, I didn't think we hired anybody <coughs> this year. We also swore in a police officer in January, but they were hired by the previous council. Just um, to clear that up. <laughs> uh, the third budget amendment is an um, amendment to the highway budget. Um, you, you recall we did a lot of paving this year. We did almost twice the number of streets that we usually do. Um, and we also had some of our seasonal help stay longer to help with some projects. So this um, would transfer $14,661. Uh, to that temporary position and the overtime for the milling and paving um, coming from regular, regular salaries. Um, this comes from one of our workers who's been on workers' comp all year. Um, so workers' comp then picks up that person's salary um, and we had that budget line available. Uh, the fourth one we have is also to highway. Uh, this base, it's highway and um, Building, building department. We had two retirements uh, recently, and these are payouts for the building inspector and an HMEO who retired. Um, and the HMEO retired in July, the building inspector retired in October. Um, and then the last one was related to the insurance from this year. Um, when we did the budget last year, we didn't have the final number from insurance. So, um, the finance director put in a number, um, it ended up being higher, and this is the differential, $36,920. And what was the total? Do you know? Um, yes, give me one moment. And is this common, Chris, for the insurance bill to not be known until the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, 
It is because when we introduce the um, when we introduce the budget in October, we haven't even received the um, renewal notification from mm -hmm. from the company. I got that probably in mid November this year, and then we had to go through all the schedules, make sure that some of the vehicles that we got rid of were deleted, some of the things we acquired were on, um, and, and it takes a little bit of back and forth. So, so again, I think we've, we've seen an escalation in insurance. It, that's one of the things that has been volatile in the last few years, and I'll get you the total number right now. Um, <coughs> just to go back to item number three for a moment, I, I believe that on our budget for 2023, there's also some milling and paving of roads. And I didn't know if the standard is that does include the salaries of those who are doing it. It just happened to be that this one evolved over time, or is that something that would need to be adjusted? The milling and paving in the capital program or the operating budget? Uh, oh, sorry, that's in the uh, capital program, isn't it? Is that, do we have that money already earmarked in our operating in our fund balance as well, or is that something that we'll make amendments in next year when we do, when we go through the projects for whichever roads we're gonna mill and pave next um, year? So the way that we do milling and paving is we use CHIPS money, which is state money for um, redoing roads. The, we're gonna be putting that into the capital program, and I think we did last year for 400,000, which is, you know, kind of a general estimate where we think we're going to hit every year. We d that covers the contract work. So that covers bringing in an outside party to do the um, milling because we don't have the machine. It's, it's a, a very expensive, like, one and a half million dollar machine or one point two million dollar machine. Um, and then we pay another contractor to come and pave. And both of those are bid. So that, the expenditures, are, are those contract things and usually we don't we, we just absorb into the regular salaries of our staff the support work that they do in preparing all of the structures in the street doing the hand work behind them coordinating in this case we just had extra overtime that we normally wouldn't have because we had so many streets so there were a couple days where we kept the staff later um, I think there was one holiday they came in on just to finish it out um, so that's that's the um, that's the budget increase that you see in number three. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and let me give you that number from the night from. Yeah, I just want to confirm that that's the same that we had in the line okay. on the budget because the, um, but it's it should be. Um, so our number nine. Yeah. So 2022, 475, 143. Yeah, close. OK. Yeah, so that, that's about, I don't know, it's about 7%, 7, 8% over what we initially <laughs> thought it was going to be. Um, OK, any other questions on that before I? Um, OK, I think that's, that's it. Um, so you have those five amendments. We would uh, put them all together in one resolution for next week. And, um, and then we'll probably have a cleanup amendment some, at some point in mid to late January. OK. And then, the schedule. yeah, so um, a couple of you have asked for the schedule so that you can try to plan travel. Um, we. Um, Ben put together an actual calendar this year, which is nice. It's very cool. Um, it's so pretty. Thank you, Ben. The other was very difficult to read. Um, and uh, so our first meeting of January, January has five Mondays, so we had a kind of choice of whether we could do it on right after New Year's and what we thought is to do the 9th, sixth, the, 9th the 17th, the 23rd, the 30th. Yes. I'd like to um, just make a comment about the summer months. Um, the last couple of years, I've, I've voiced my opposition to combining the city council workshop meet and the regular meetings on account that um, this is the people's business, not ours. Um, and when you combine meetings, unless we want to have meetings like the planning board, um, our meetings will inevitably be shorter. I was reassured last year that combining 
the workshops and the regular meetings would actually just be the full length of a combined workshop and a meeting. We actually had one meeting last July, I think it was, that was less than one hour, um, even though it was a combined meeting. Um, I feel like when we do these combined meetings that we're selling the public short. Um, and I see now that we've added June to this plan. Um, last year it was only July and August. I know there was an email about this earlier. Um, I just want to say that I don't agree with this uh, calendar and I'd like to have a discussion about the summer months. I mean, I like to have weeks off too, um, but this isn't about us. This is about the people's business. and. If you ask me, we should be doing more, uh, not less, meetings. I mean, we should be doing more work, uh, not less. Does anybody else uh, share that sentiment or have a different view? Or willing to have the discussion? <laughs> I guess I never felt like we were not doing any work. I didn't feel like we compromised any, any responsibilities or anything. Um, well, if we had a meeting that was less than an hour and it was a workshop and a regular meeting, that would be two meetings that would have been less than a half hour, which I've never seen before. So I'm pretty sure that because when we're combining the meetings, we're actually trying to keep the meetings within a manageable amount of time. Um, so how, two two hours meetings don't become a four hour meeting. But how do we control what happened? I mean, we have an agenda and we have people allowed to speak as much as they would at any other meeting. Yeah, I think the agendas were a little lighter. Uh -huh. And I think we should be probably having bigger agendas and doing more things is my preference. Mm. If, if I could, I w this is firstly just a proposal. Um, we, ben and I and the mayor talked about, and the, and the attorneys talked about um, adding June, and we, we thought that, that would make sense. For us, um, there's kind of an ebb and flow of what goes on your agenda. Like we have a whole flurry at the beginning of the year because you're starting. We, we have a really intense time often around the capital program, which comes out in May. Um, again, then after the summer is over, we're preparing for budget, and that becomes, um, you know, again, that takes three or four meetings just on its own. Um, I, I would say last summer was really helpful to us advancing projects. There's, there's a lot of time that goes into just um, getting ready for a meeting, executing the meeting. Um, and, it, and again, I don't think we did any less. I mean, we did a lot of work last year. You, you did a lot of legislating. You did a lot of projects. Um, and again, I heard good feedback from other members of the council that they thought that that was a good system. Mm -hmm. So again, you don't have to do, you, you can decide to do whatever you want, but it, um, understand that the people's business uh, happens every day here. I mean, we're, you, you guys call me, you email me about things. We have projects we're working on. You have a list of things you want us to do. Um, we got a lot of those done last year during these two months because we weren't on the treadmill of running every week. The other, the other thing to consider is your code does not require you to do workshops at all. You're required by your code to do two voting meetings a month and then um, you're allowed to do workshops. So that convention is, is not statutory or code driven. No, maybe not, but it still seems like the right thing to do. If we don't, if we get, <coughs> if we are focused on budget from September onwards and the beginning of the year is we're, fo we're focusing on the, on the setup stuff, it seems that half of the critical months where we can introduce new ideas um, those n the number of meetings is being reduced during that period. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to be a wet blanket if everybody else wants the weeks off, but I'm, I, I mean, I always, I'm always I, have, I have a mountain of ideas that I'd love to propose, and then I see that our calendar is being reduced. I'm sure you guys have ideas too. I mean, there's no shortage of legislation that we could be discussing and topics we uh, could be addressing. I mean, I'll just say that I want to, I, I, I feel two ways about this. I mean, one, I want to make sure that, um, the way the the work that we're doing as accountable and how we gather is also sustainable to the people behind the scenes um, in the city. But at the same time, I don't want to make the public feel like we're shorting them on opportunities. Um, I don't know how I feel about adding the extra month of uh, June to the lightened calendar, but. Um, 
I, I think I would like to also see the summer as an opportunity to maybe host as, as just like individual council members, like more public forums um, and more ways to like take advantage of the warmer weather to meet on the ground with our constituents and talk to um, them one on one. I, I mean, I see that as an opportunity for that, but I also, Dan, I really do value and respect your opinion and I'm more than happy to talk this out further. Sort of related to that idea, I wonder if in those off weeks, if there are topics we have, if there's a way, and, and Chris and Ben, I would love your input here to like have, you know, we have a topic, because one of our challenges is that we can't, dis we can't discuss all more than three of us, because that violates quorum. Um, but if we had an opportunity to have a conversation, but it re might require less work on the city's end, maybe not, maybe I'm making that, maybe, maybe I'm just like describing a workshop, Molly. Um, but I, I, I could see value in that. Um, I'm also very aware that, uh, that you know, the elections are gonna be coming up next year and the summer is usually a busy time for stuff around that, whether we ourselves are running or supporting others locally. So um, I am sort of conscious of how many hours I have to give to this work generally. So I would say I'm, I'm open to there being, I guess I don't know the technical thing of this, open to there being um, the option of having meetings on our dead weeks if there were like particular things we wanted to discuss and that seemed like a good time uh, for us to kind of hash through and the way we've had some really productive workshops recently. Um, I also have a, s a, if we do do the every other week, I actually have a question and suggestion around what's in July, but I will wait to share that unless others want to share their thoughts about the double meetings first. Chris, if I, if I may just speak to Molly's point, um, at any time you can always call a special meeting. So if the city council adopts this calendar, it doesn't prohibit you from adding meetings at any time. So, you know, we just have to meet the necessary notice requirements, but you can always decide to have an additional meeting if you think it's appropriate. I guess where does where does this end? I mean, if we've we did two months and now we're adding a third month, where we do? I mean, why don't we just do the whole year at this point? I mean, w w like next year, do we want to add another month? I, I just don't really understand the value of having two of combining meetings in June. I just don't I don't see it. I mean, presumably, you know, anybody with a primary would have an election in June, but that's that's what's hard about this work, and we. We have to roll with it. I don't think I should have time off in June if I have a primary. I don't. I don't know. I just don't see it that way. The, yeah, the, I think I think if we um, kind of pulled what other communities do, I think what we would find is that we have more meetings than others. I think that's what's causing this. And I certainly, you know, am very sensitive to um, staff time. I'm, um, I feel like you know there's a lot of burden there. Um, but we can do some checks. Why don't we compare what other communities do? Would that be helpful? Or maybe just, you know, out of respect for, I remember council member, you know, I remember Dan bringing this up before and feeling uncomfortable about the summer months. And now we've added a month. Maybe we just compromise and don't add June. Uh, how would you feel about that, Dan? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, just a recommendation that I'm just throwing out there. Because I hear everybody's... I sort of agree with everyone, <laughs> so I, I'm just looking for, I don't know if, if that would work. I don't know. I mean, I thought, I thought capacity wasn't going to be an issue this coming year because we talked about it during the budget and we agreed not to add capacity during the budget. So I don't, I don't really understand where staff hours is coming in because we agreed that more capacity wasn't needed at the time. Dan, Dan I, I think you have to keep in mind, like, Every, every organization, including your household, has a capacity. Like, you can give me as much money as you want, but I have a building that only has so many seats. I have a staff that has only so many people that manage. Um, I mean, we have these major projects going this year. So yeah, you know, I'm the one who suggested doing June because, A, I don't think you'd lose a lot. Basically, what your meeting becomes is your workshop. The voting part of this is often really quick. Right? Like our, our voting meetings, unless you're having some kind of public hearing, are often like about an hour. So we thought we could put it together. 
that's the peak time for my staff and I on these projects. And, and again, I've, we've got the firehouse, we've got, I'm not going to apologize for saying we have limits on our capacity. Everybody's got that and you have to make choices and you have to prioritize. You can't do everything and if you did that, you, you wouldn't get anything done. And I don't mean to interrupt the back and forth, but I just wanted to put my idea out there again of the compromise. It sounds like Dan was okay with that. Um, does that make sense? I don't know. I think in my mind, I'm happy to meet every Monday, um, but I want to balance that with what is capacity for our administration and our workers. Um, and. I, my inclination is to, is to defer to you, Chris, about which months are most critical to have that interruption flow, um, but I would like to limit it this time around to two months, whether that is June and July, or July and August, or July and half of June, or ha half of August, or if that is um, sort of like we've done in December, um, sort of peppering these um, combined meetings and just periods that make sense for workflow, um, but I am hesitant to increase the number of times we're doing this from year to year. Um, I, I would be fine as it is to start and also fine to add more, and I especially like your idea, Paloma, of adding um, maybe adding one more to June. It's not the full month. You know, I, I, Chris, if you can, I know you made this proposal, if there's something, uh, you know, we don't have to vote on this, or maybe we do. Drew can let us know we have to you, approve You this. do have to vote on it, so. Do we again, have to vote on it next week, or yeah. can we vote on it? So we have to vote on it before the. We have to vote year. on it next week, but we can amend it later on if we decide. Because we've done I mean, it if, if, uh, if you don't want to do June, that's fine. I mean, it was a proposal, yeah. you know? And again, I think if you look at, I just looked at two, City of Beacon meets twice a month and City of Kingston meets once a month. What was the first one again? City of Newburgh, Newburgh. twice Newburgh. a month. So again. I mean, we all know that because when people t ask us, you know, how often do you meet, once a month? And we say, no, we meet every Monday. They always say, oh my goodness, right? Doesn't that happen to everyone? Mm -hmm. So, but that's not the point. That's not, that's not Dan's point. So if you're open to adding back June, it seems like a good. I'd like that. Yep, and City of Poughkeepsie is also twice a month, so. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds like we're there. Can we go on? Yeah. Um, what, what did you have to say about July? Oh, July. Um, I saw that we're meeting the 3rd and the 17th, and then from the 17th, to the 7th of August is three weeks. I'm just wondering if we could move July to the 10th and the 24th. The reason being that the, the July 4th is the holiday on the Tuesday, and I would just assume there might be some city employees who want to take off July 3rd. Um, obviously, we're all going to be around for the Beacon fireworks that haven't been announced yet. Uh, but, but I'm just wondering if we're going to have two in July, just moving each of those two back a week would, would, would be amenable to, to people. Um, again, it's it's mainly to avoid July third is our is a meeting in July. I think that's a smart recommendation. Yeah, and then we still have one week off, one week on, one week off. One week yeah, off. yeah, and you do have yeah, especially if we are doing June, you actually then um, don't have a three week gap in that. Thing. Then were there any conflicts with other committees using the room, or what? Do you see an I'd issue to, with shifting it to ten and twenty four? I'd have to check. Um, I don't know those schedules. We'll, we'll check that. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't see what would, what would be the issue there. Yeah. So ten and July tenth and July twenty fourth. Yeah. Okay. I had a related question. Um, I know we had brought this up um, uh, last year, but I know that we have named um, the second. Um, second Monday in October, Indigenous Peoples Day on this calendar, which we do have discretion over, but, um, and I know uh, Nick isn't here, uh, but he said that he was going to be looking into if there was other powers that we had um, as a city municipality of um, adjusting the names of certain holidays. Um, I just wanted to bring that 
up. I know this is a discussion that the school board is having at, at this time. Um, and if there is uh, any, any room for the city to have that discussion as well, I would like to do so. Well, I'll make a note, a note of that. Nick and I, Nick had mentioned that a while back, and I don't remember where that conversation ended, so I'll check back in and then do the research if necessary. Thank you, Drew. So we'll amend that and bring it back next week with the two changes you asked for. Thank you. And that's all I got. No, uh, no exec session. Good. Thank you, George. Thank My you, George. pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I think everyone. I think Nick will be here next week. So I did just want to wish you all uh, happy holidays. I know Ben cut me off last week. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and that's the only reason why you're here tonight. I'm sure, Drew. Exactly. Just I said sure. I had to come back to make sure I got my uh, comments in. But I, I do wish you all a very happy, healthy holidays and enjoy the time with your family. And I guess I'll see you next year. Bye, right. Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, Drew. <laughs> well, that would have been funny if I cut you off. Yeah. Have, a yeah. have a good night, Lou. Have a good night. Yeah, you cut her right off. Recordings. Yeah, it was like she's like talking. It was like recording is. <laughs> <laughs>